Hello, guys. So let's discuss another measure symptom in dermatology, which are rashes. Okay. So uh, how to take history when a patient present with a rash? So first of all, you will ask about the site. Where exactly do you have this rash? And then you will ask about odipara. Do you remember the odipara onset, duration, intensity, progression, aggravating factor, relieving factor, and anything else? But here you will do odipara. You will ask about the frequency as well. If the ratios are not permanent, they appear from time to time, then you will ask about the frequency as well. Other than that, you will ask about the surrounding area of the rash. How is the surrounding area of the rash? And then you will ask about the symptoms of the rash, whether the rash is causing any symptom or it is asymptomatic, whether there is any pain, any itching, any discharge from it or not, okay? Now, rash is a very vague symptom, okay? It can, you know, in a large variety of diseases, uh, you can have rashes, but uh, what are the red flags in the rash? So meningitis and anaphylaxis. Meningitis and anaphylaxis are the red flags of the rash. And in every patient, every patient who present with a rash, either in exam or in real life, you have to rule out meningitis and anaphylaxis because these two conditions are what can kill a patient, okay? So I want you to remember, if, if, I, if I could uh, make one point specific for rash for you to remember, I would say remember, that you have to exclude meningitis and anaphylaxis, okay? I cannot stress this enough. All right. So uh, as I already told you that uh, rash can present in a wide variety of diseases. So after taking um, a history of a rash, that is odipara, surrounding area, and symptoms, you have to do symptomatic review here, okay? So basically, the red flag questions are fever. So fever with a rash point out toward uh, meningitis. Any headache or neck stiffness, another pointer toward meningitis and difficulty in breathing is a pointer toward anaphylaxis. But other than that, you should also do rest of the symptomatic review. That is chest pain, abdominal pain, and change in bowel habits. You know, change in bowel habits. So rash can occur even with celiac disease. Rash can occur even with IBD. Okay. Also chest pain and a rash, it can, uh, it, it can, uh, you know, it can occur in herpes zoster. So you should do the symptomatic review with the rash as well. Also, if the patient is a child, so you should ask uh, another three or four questions, which are also very important in case of kids. So you should ask uh, whether he's active or playful or he's drowsy, okay? Is he eating or drinking as usual? Any fever or vomiting, any fits, etc. Okay, all these four are red flags in case of kids, okay? So if the child is drowsy, if the child is not able to eat or drink as usual, if the child has fever or vomiting or if he is having fits, all of these are red flags and you need to ask these if the patient who is presenting with rash is a child, okay? Also, if the patient is a child, then you need to ask the pediatric question. I will discuss more in detail in pediatrics, but uh, the pediatric question, which are, uh, you know, uh, uh, which are uh, symbolized by the mnemonic BIRD, that is birth history and then immunization history and then the uh, red book, which is the developmental history and then the diet. So you should ask those questions as well if the patient is a child, okay? So this whole will be your history of presenting illness in case of a rash. And then you should ask past history. So past history of any similar rashes and past history of any other skin condition or any other medical illness. Okay, uh, Meftosa, you should ask any medications because rashes can occur as side effect of medications, allergies, because eczema can present with rash and eczema has a very strong correlation with allergies. Family history of similar rashes, anyone in the family who's having a similar rash at the moment, okay, anyone in close contact having a similar rash, and then uh, any travel recently, and then the psychosocial part. So rash is basically another symptom where each and every part of the history is important. Okay, so then lifestyle questions, smoking, alcohol, diet, exercise, and um, um, recreational drug use and sexual history. Okay, then after completing your history, you should ask about ideas, concerns, and expectations, and then go to the examination part where you will verbalize vitals, GPE, and examine the rash as well. Okay, now let's go towards the differential diagnosis of rash, which are many. So the first one here is, is empatigo. How you are going to explain empatigo to the patient? You will tell the patient that empatigo is a skin infection caused by bacteria and it is highly contagious. Now, basically, empatigo, the patient, uh, in empatigo, patients present with rash, but in empatigo, uh, the rash is mainly on the face, especially around the mouth. 
it looks like chicken pox but it's not in the whole body it's only around the mouth okay and it's caused by staphorius um, uh, staphorius bacteria no need to tell the patient about staphorius just tell him that it is a skin infection caused by bacteria and it is highly highly contagious okay and it uh, just for your uh, for your sake um, um i told you that it's caused by staphorius and it looks like chicken pox but it is around the mouth you can google the picture of uh, empetigo um you will tell the patient that we will give you a topical antibiotic cream, calfucidic acid, which is to be applied two to three times a day until the infection fully heals, which take about two weeks. Okay, so the treatment is pretty uh, simple: fusidic acid, which is a topical antibiotic cream, and the patient needs to apply two to three times a day until the infection is clear, which is about two weeks. Fusidic acid can be used even by the penicillin allergic patients because it does not contain even uh, any penicillin component. General advice will be to avoid direct contact, avoid uh, direct contact with anyone touching the lesion and wash hands frequently with soap and water and also avoid school and work until the lesion heals because it's highly contagious. Uh, safety netting would be please come back if, it, uh, if you develop fever or the lesions worsen. So basically, if acidic acid doesn't work, then we give oral antibiotic against uh, Staph aureus. So tell the patient that if you develop fever or the lesion worsen, then please come back. The next is eczema. So eczema is basically uh, inflammatory skin condition and eczema has a very strong correlation with allergies. It is a very strong uh, eczema patient have a very strong family history and uh, they have a lot of allergies, personal history of allergies and family history of allergies and it also have a very strong correlation with asthma. So look out for these points during history taking and basically the patient tells you that the uh, their skin is very dry. If you see an eczema patient in real life, their skin is really dry and they need to use a lot of emollients, a lot of moisturizers and uh, even the, the normal soaps, they, you know, very adversely affect their skin. Their skin is pretty sensitive. Okay, so how do you explain it to the patient? Uh, you tell the patient that it is an inflammatory condition of the skin which results in dry and itchy skin. The treatment is basically giving them emollient. So we tell the patient that we will give you an emollient cream, a strong moisturizer, which is called Dermol. And you should use it regularly and as frequently as you can. Okay, avoid detergents, avoid bubble bath and give them medicated soaps, which are which do not dry out the skin. Okay. All right. Um, safety netting. So safety netting here is, you will tell the patient that any redness, crusting or oozing of the skin will mean that your skin has got infected, so please come back. Now, basically, uh, skin is the barrier which protects people from bacteria. And in eczema patient, the skin is really damaged. It's really dry and it is damaged due to itching. Um, so they are really prone to bacterial infections. And the bacterial infections of the skin can be very dangerous in these patients. So you need to safety net them about bacterial infection of the skin. The third differential is cholinergic or tricharia or allergic rash. So allergic rash can be a patient, um, especially it presents in childhood. So allergic rash can be a patient who tells you that the, the child randomly gets rash when he's playing. Or, um, for example, the trigger here can be pollen. And um, when, a, when a person is allergic to one, you know, uh, one stimulus, he tends to be allergic to more than one stimulus. So... Um, they might tell you that they get um, rash under a variety of setting, like when playing outside, where the trigger can be pollen, even inside the house, uh, when the temperature is really warm, with some type of clothes as well. So that is basically cholinergic atricaria. You will tell the patient there is reaction of the child body to different type of stimulus, for example, pollen and even to heat, in which case we call it heat bumps. And uh, you will uh, make sure that the parent is reassured that it is nothing serious. And you'll tell them that it is uh, a self-limiting condition and it is really a harmless condition. It is just a type of allergy and reaction of the child's body to some external stimuli. Uh, you'll tell them that we will give them a syrup of anti-allergic medication, which is called citrazine. And you can give them, you can give it to the child before going to the play and dress them in light clothes. If heat is the trigger, then you will tell them that uh, uh, when you are giving bath to the child, keep the washroom warm, but water look warm, okay? And you will tell them that the child will grow out of it. But you need to safety net them for anaphylaxis and meningitis. So you tell them that whenever the child get a rash and there is fever with it, or the child complains of headache or neck pain, or whenever there is shortness of breath or swelling of the lips with it, then please call triple nine or go to the emergency department because you don't want them uh, to, you know, a child, you don't want the child to get a rash 
and uh, it's because of meningitis and the parent will think that oh it's just an allergic reaction so you must warn them uh, you must warn them for anaphylaxis and meningitis uh, the next differential here is scabies so scabies as you all know is uh, it occurs in crowded area and in places where the hygiene there is no uh, importance given to the hygiene and uh, so in unhygienic places really and in scabies Patient present with a rash in armpit, inguinal regions, and genital. So basically, in between the fingers, and in the axilla, in the inguinal region, and around the genitals, in the skin folds, and there is intense itching, especially at night. Okay, so these are the pointers in the history. Uh, how will you explain this to the patient? We'll tell the patient that it is a parasitic infestation, okay? Not an infection, but an infestation. So it is a parasitic infestation, and it can happen when you visit really crowded areas. Uh, how you are going to treat this, you will give, you will tell the patient that we are going to give you a cream, which is called permethrin 5%, and you have to apply it over the whole body. You need to apply it uh, over the whole body and wait for it to dry before putting on the clothes. You need to apply it once today and then after one week. And uh, not only you, but everyone in the household and their sexual partners need to apply it. Uh, if you wash hands, if you happen to wash hands after applying the cream, then you need to reapply it okay, over the hands. And um, you need to tell them that even after completing the treatment, there may be some residual aging, but it only stays for less than two weeks. So if the aging lasts for more than two weeks, then please come back. You also you should also tell them that uh, you need to discard all the, you need to, you know, wash all the clothes and all the bed sheets and the towels that you use at home uh, at temperatures about 60, above 60 degree, okay? So this is some general advice. So that was all about scabies. There are actually a lot of differentials in rash, and we'll discuss all of them today. Okay, then there is an acne. Okay, so acne is all of you know pretty common, uh, especially in teenagers. So how will you explain it to the patient? You will tell them that it is an inflammation of the skin. Okay, and it's nothing really serious. Um, so in cases in cases of mild acne, the first line treatment is benzoyl peroxide cream. Okay, benzoyl peroxide cream for 12 weeks, that is basically three months. And if it doesn't get better, then you'll ask the patient to uh, come again after 12 weeks and you will give the second line treatment, which is basically topical antibiotic cream and topical retinoids. So the first line is topical benzoyl peroxide, which is for 12 weeks or three months. And if it doesn't get better, then topical antibiotic cream and topical retinoids. If it still doesn't get better, then the next option is oral antibiotics, which are basically long term. So for three months or six months and oral retinoids, but the decision will be taken by the dermatologist. So you will refer this patient to the dermatologist. If the patient present with moderate acne, then you will give, uh, then you will start with this treatment that is topical antibiotic cream and topical retinoid. Um, and if it doesn't get better, then refer to dermatologist. If the patient present with severe acne, then you refer to dermatologist because severe acne uh, needs treatment with oral retinoids. Basically, retinoids, oral retinoids, uh, the GP cannot give oral retinoids because they are they have a lot of side effects, especially they are hepatotoxic, they are renotoxic, they are teratogenic. So uh, when the patient is on retinoids, you need to perform LFTs and RFTs every four weeks, okay? So they are not uh, really safe drugs and you need to be really cautious. That's why they, they are under the domain of dermatologist and not GP. Uh, now, another important point with acne is because acne affects the face. So it can have a huge impact on the patient's mood and the patient's confidence. So you will always have to assess the mood. And if the patient is depressed because of acne, then you need to arrange CBT for the patient as well. Okay, so... Uh, always ask about the mood in cases of acne because it affects the person's look and affects the person's mood and confidence. All right, uh, some general advice to the acne patient, avoid over cleaning and over scrubbing. Remember that acne is not because of the dirty skin, okay? So it's just an inflammatory condition of the skin. You need to explain it to the patient because there are some myths going around that acne is because a person doesn't clean their face very often. So tell them to avoid over cleaning because it's just going to exacerbate the acne. Avoid any exfoliation as well and avoid scratching because all of these things exacerbate acne and tell them that you will give them um, medicated face washes for the acne and you also tell them that uh, apply sunscreen SPF more than 60 when they go outside because uh, exposure to sunlight can also exacerbate acne. 
so this is some general advice about acne also you can tell them avoid oil based uh, cosmetics and use water based cosmetics if you have time you can give this sort of general advice the next differential here is intertigo so intertigo is basically it's basically a fungal infection and it's under the skin folds like under the breast and in the axilla etc in the groin and it's really occur in those areas which can become sweaty okay so it sweaty and humid areas predisposed to fungal infection the treatment here is hydrocortisone cream and antifungal cream okay so it needs to be applied two times a day uh, two to three times a day for two weeks two creams hydrocortisone and antifungal because basically it's a fungal infection needs to apply it two to three times a day for two weeks and once the infection settles then the patient should use barrier cream like zinc and castor oil because once the infection occurs then it's really common for this patient to have another infection so tell them to regularly apply barrier creams like zinc and castor oil to prevent any reinfection intertrigo is also really very common especially in hot and humid areas and patient who are a bit overweight because under their skin fold, they can have a lot of sweat and uh, they are predisposed to fungal infection in general. Cellulitis. So cellulitis is basically a medical emergency. So it's basically a rash on the leg and the leg is also swollen and it's hot and the patient is running a fever. There may be some trigger for cellulitis, like maybe a trauma, which has become infected, a trauma spot, which has become infected. It can be insect bite. So there is some trigger for the cellulitis. And there is a rash on the leg. The leg is swollen. The patient is running fever. So for a patient with swollen leg, you must rule out DVT and you must rule out acute limb ischemia. So for DVT, you will ask the DVT question, okay? Any heart racing, any chest pain. And you will ask about the DVT risk factors, like are you, uh, by any chance, are you pregnant? Are you taking any oral contraceptive pills? If the patient is female, young female of reproductive age and uh, any recent travel for acute limb ischemia. Uh, obviously, we'll do examination of the leg and look for pulse, pallor, etc. But acute limb ischemia will have a long history and cellulitis will have a really short history. Acute limb ischemia will have some pain after... Um, yeah, acute limb ischemia will have a history of uh, um, pain in the legs after for a long, for long time. Okay, our acute limb ischemia patient can have a history of atrial fibrillation and history of heart disease. Okay, so... Uh, and the limb will be pulseless and pale on examination. Uh, how will you explain cellulitis to the patient? You will tell the patient that uh, it is a skin infection that can unfortunately be serious if not treated promptly. So we'll tell them that we are going to refer you immediately to the hospital. In the hospital, they will take some blood uh, tests. They'll take some um, blood for you for some tests, which include routine blood tests, inflammatory markers that, are ESR, that is ESR and CRP, blood culture, and they will also take swab from your rash. Uh, to look uh, what uh, to uh, find out what bug is causing this infection and you will tell them that they will start you on antibiotics through your veins uh, and also give you some painkillers so this is basically a treatment for cellulitis just remember that it is a medical emergency and that you have to rule out dvt and acute limb ischemia the treatment is very simple for cellulitis you have to refer immediately to the hospital and tell them what is going to happen in the hospital Okay, measles. Uh, measles, another important differential. So as you all know, measles is a viral infection. It is caused by viral bug and it can be transferred from one person to another. And you should tell, explain in these uh, simple words to a patient as well. Okay, measles can occur in children. It can occur in adults. Basically in adults, measles is even more severe and the patient's condition is even more worse. Treatment here, as we all know, that the treatment for uh, measles is basically symptomatic. So we'll tell them that please be assured that it is self-limiting. Take some paracetamol for fever. Uh, drink lots of fluids to keep yourself hydrated. Rest. Stay away from school or work, okay? Because it's highly contagious. So we'll tell them to stay away from school or work for at least four days after the development of rash, and ideally until full recovery. So ideally it is until full recovery, but obviously if the patient has to go to work, uh, if the patient has some important project or if the patient is student, then you will tell them that at least four days, okay? There is no chance that you can go to work or school before four days, but um, ideally you should wait uh, for full recovery, but you can uh, certainly go after four days if it's something really important for you. Okay, uh, avoid contact with pregnant women, young children, and immunocompromised people. Okay, because it can because it can spread to them and it can be really dangerous for in this in this population. Safety netting. Please come to the hospital immediately if you develop any shortness of breath. 
altered consciousness, fever, and conversion. So it's basically measles encephalitis or measles pneumonia. So you are basically safety netting them for measles pneumonia by telling them if you develop any shortness of breath. And for measles encephalitis, if you are telling them if you develop fever, fits, or you become uh, drowsy, or you have altered consciousness, then please call triple nine or come to the emergency department. Follow up uh, for measles patient should be at one week, okay? Uh, also in measles, you should uh, inform Public Health England, okay? Because measles is a notifiable disease and they need to do contact tracing. So this, that was all about rashes. I hope it was helpful. And uh, if you like the video, then please give a, give a thumbs up and drop a comment. Uh, and I will see you soon in the next video.